Molecular Orbital Theory, Part 2. We're now going to extend our discussion to include molecular orbitals that are formed by combining p orbitals. These will form both sigma and pi molecular orbitals. Please do not watch this video without watching part one first. It's really not a standalone video and it's gonna be super confusing if you haven't seen part one. So just like our electrons from our s orbitals can interfere constructively and destructively, so too can the electrons in the p orbitals. And it will follow a very similar pattern. Just like in our s orbitals, we combine two orbitals to get two new orbitals, we'll do the same for each set of our p orbitals. However many orbitals we'll start with is how many we end up with. Each time we combine two orbitals, we'll get two new orbitals. One will be from the constructive interference of wave functions, and one will be from the destructive interference of wave functions. These will be bonding and antibonding orbitals, respectively. Bonding orbitals will be lower in energy than the antibonding orbitals. If electrons are added to a bonding orbital, it will add to the bond order. And if it's added to an antibonding orbital, it will subtract from the bond order. Here are some guidelines on how to make the MO diagrams. You'll first want to count your valence electrons and draw atomic energy level diagrams just like we did in the previous chapters. You'll do one for each atom that is involved in the molecule. Between these, you'll put the appropriate molecular orbital diagram. We'll see the basic structures of these in a moment. Then you'll count your total number of electrons from each atom and fill in from low energy to high, obeying all the same rules that you used when doing atomic energy level diagrams in earlier sections of the course. Let's do some examples so that you can see how this works. We have already talked about how the s orbitals combine to form MO diagrams, and we've done the first four elements on the periodic table. The s orbitals for the later elements will combine in a similar manner. So now we need to talk about what happens with the p orbitals. Just like with the s orbitals, you combine two atomic orbitals, one from each atom, to get two molecular orbitals. One will be a bonding, a low energy, and one will be an antibonding, or a high energy orbital. However, since there are three p orbitals in each atom, we also have different ways that these must overlap in order to form bonds. They can overlap on an end-to-end -end manner, forming, forming a sigma bond and a sigma antibonding orbital. Here you can see the picture of the p orbitals and the resulting bonding and antibonding orbitals that occur. Notice that these are also called sigma orbitals just like when we combined the s orbitals. That's because they have the same symmetry that goes along the bond axis. Now we'll look at a different type of overlap, which has a different type of symmetry, and is therefore named something different as well. Notice, just like with the s orbitals, we combined two orbitals and got two new orbitals. For each set of p orbitals, we will combine this will happen once. And that's because of the geometry of the p orbitals. They can only overlap end on end once. So let's think about why this is. In our two atoms, we have p orbitals that are being used to bond. So we can look at how these can possibly overlap. Given that they're all spaced 90 degrees from each other, only one of these is able to form an end on end overlap like we see here. The other two orbitals must overlap with what we call a side-on-side -side overlap. These are going to have a different type of symmetry. So perhaps my drawing helped you visualize this. If not, we'll look at some other versions of the drawing as well. If they overlap side-on-side, -side, they're going to form slightly different shapes. Just like before, they can overlap 
constructively or destructively. Each time this happens, we combine two atomic orbitals and we get the two new molecular orbitals, one of which is bonding and one of which is antibonding. Though notice this will happen twice because we have two sets of p orbitals that can overlap side on side. They're just in different planes. Also notice the shapes are much different now. Rather than just being symmetrical along the bond axis, each orbital has two lobes. And these lobes have a plane running down the center. We call orbitals with this type of symmetry pi orbitals. We'll still put the little star on the antibonding orbital, and we'll still include the subscripts telling us where the orbital came from. But now it's called a pi orbital instead of a sigma orbital. Now think back to the last slide. We actually have the two orbitals that will, sets of orbitals that'll do this. They just happen on different planes. So let's quickly summarize and review what we've just talked about on the last couple of slides. P orbitals form sigma and sigma star molecular orbitals if they overlap end on end, or pi and pi star orbitals if they overlap side on side. They can only have one set per energy level that, enter, that overlap end on end, but they have two sets that overlap side on side. We can add and subtract the orbitals to get bonding and antibonding orbitals. In total, we'll start with six atomic orbitals and we'll end with six molecular orbitals. And then we'll fill in the electrons from low to high energy, just like we did in atomic energy level diagrams. But now we need to talk about how these orbitals compare to each other in terms of energy so that we can actually draw the MO diagrams. So how do all these energy levels shake out? After all, instead of just one of each, now we have six, and they form slightly different types of orbitals depending on how they overlap. Let's look at two examples of second row homonuclear diatomics. For the S orbitals, nothing really changes compared to what we talked about on the last video. I've drawn these out for oxygen and nitrogen. For simplicity and space reasons, I'm only gonna do the valence shell. If you really wanna do the 1s level, you can do that as well. But now we also have to figure out the p orbitals and how those form molecular orbitals. There are actually two possibilities for this, depending on the molecules that we are talking about. Oxygen and nitrogen show us examples of each ordering. Notice that pi's and sigma's are not the same energy. However, your pi orbitals are degenerate with each other. Remember that the term degenerate means that they have the same energy level. So sigma and pi orbitals are not degenerate. However, your set of pi orbitals are degenerate. Sigma star is always higher than pi star for these. However, notice in the bonding orbitals. I've circled these to draw your attention to them. Here, the sigma and pi bonding orbitals are reversed in energy depending on which one you're talking about. This is caused by what's called a mixing between orbitals. We're not going to go into the details on exactly how this happens, but you are expected to know which diatomics follow which patterns for the second row. On the next slide, we'll talk about this. Let's look at the entire second row to see how you can quickly decide which molecular energy level diagram you should start with. I have tried to make this a bit more detailed than most general chemistry books so that you can see why the switch in orbital occurs to some degree anyway. You can see how as we grow across the periodic table, the sigma gets closer and closer to the pi orbital because it is lowering in energy. Now, at a given point, it becomes so low that it's actually lower than the pi orbital. And this is when the quote switch in ordering occurs happens. So notice that it happens between the N2 and the O2. So to remember which orbital energy levels to use, you simply need to remember that until nitrogen, the pi is lower, and then for oxygen and beyond, 
the sigma is lower. For any other diatomic, both homo and hetero, I will tell you the ordering of the, of the MO diagrams. You should know how to draw each of these diagrams without help from scratch. For anything other than the first and second row homonuclear diatomics, we will help with the ordering of the molecular orbitals. Now let's determine the bond order for each example. We talked about how to do this in the previous video, so if you don't remember the basic formulas, it might be useful to go back and rewatch that section of the video. For our first one, we have two, four electrons in our bonding orbitals and two in our antibonding orbitals, which gives us a bond order of one. For carbon, we have two, four, six in our bonding orbitals and two in our antibonding orbitals. So we are given a bond order of six minus two divided by two equals four. For nitrogen, we have eight, so six here and two here in our bonding orbitals, two in our antibonding orbitals, which gives us a bond order of three. For oxygen, we still have eight in our bonding orbitals, but now we have four in our antibonding orbitals, giving us a bond order of two. For fluorine, we have eight in our bonding orbitals, but we have two, four, six in our antibonding orbitals, giving us a bond order of one. For neon, we have eight in each, giving us a bond order of zero. Here's a quick checklist for you to help you prevent silly errors when drawing MO diagrams. Did you make sure to label the atomic orbitals? Remember, those are off to the side, but you still have to draw them. Did you label all the molecular orbitals? Did you remember to add the star to the antibonding orbitals? Did you add or subtract electrons as appropriate if you have an ion? Did you use the proper order for orbitals for the MO diagrams? We've now continued our discussion of MO diagrams to include the P atomic orbitals to form sigma and pi molecular orbitals. We've talked about the ordering of their energy level and how they aren't the same for all homonuclear diatomics. We've talked about the filling order We've talked about common mistakes and how to ensure you don't make them. So hopefully this helps you be able to draw MO diagrams for second row homonuclear diatomics.